Ladies and gentlemen, please meet David Sedaris. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in 1999, I put out a collection of Christmas stories, and then a few years later, I wrote this, and it's called Six to Eight Black Men. I've never been much for guidebooks, so when trying to get my bearings in some strange American city, I normally start by asking the cab driver or hotel clerk some silly question regarding the latest census figures. I say silly because I don't really care how many people live in Olympia, Washington, or Columbus, Ohio. They're nice enough places, but the numbers mean nothing to me. My second question might have to do with the average annual rainfall, which again doesn't tell me anything about the people who have chosen to call this place home. What really interests me are the local gun laws. <laughs> Can I carry a concealed weapon? And if so, under what circumstances? <laughs> What's the waiting period for a Tommy gun? Could I buy a Glock 17 if I were recently divorced or fired from my job? <laughs> I've learned from experience that it's best to lead into this subject as delicately as possible, <laughs> especially if you and the local citizen are alone and enclosed in a relatively small area. Bide your time, though, and you can walk away with some excellent stories. I've learned, for example, that the blind can legally hunt in both Texas and Michigan. <laughs> in Texas, they must be accompanied by a sighted companion, but I heard that in Michigan, they're allowed to go it alone. <laughs> Which raises the question, how do they find whatever it is they just shot? <laughs> In addition to that, how do they get it home? <laughs> Are the Michigan blind allowed to drive as well? <laughs> I ask about guns, not because I want one of my own, but because the answers vary so widely from state to state. In a country that's become increasingly homogeneous, I'm reassured by these last charming touches of regionalism. <laughs> Firearms aren't really an issue in Europe, so when traveling abroad, my first question usually relates to barnyard animals. <laughs> what do your roosters say is a good icebreaker? <laughs> As every country has its own unique interpretation. In Germany, where dogs bark, vow, vow, and both the frog and the duck say quack, the rooster greets the dawn with a hearty kikariki. Greek roosters crow kiriaki. And in France, they scream cocorico, which sounds like one of those horrible pre-mixed cocktails with a pirate on the label. <laughs> when told that an American rooster says cock-a-doodle-doo, my hosts look at me with disbelief and pity. <laughs> When do you open your Christmas presents is another good conversation starter, as I think it explains a lot about national character. People who traditionally open gifts on Christmas Eve seem a bit more pious and family-oriented than those who wait until Christmas morning. They go to Mass, open presents, eat a late meal, return to church the following morning, and devote the rest of the day to eating another big meal. Gifts are generally reserved for children, and the parents tend not to go overboard. It's nothing I'd want for myself. <laughs> but I suppose it's fine for those who prefer food and family to things of real value. <laughs> in France and Germany, gifts are exchanged on Christmas Eve, while in the Netherlands, the children open their presents on December 5th in celebration of St. Nicholas Day. It sounded sort of quaint until I spoke to a man named Oscar who filled me in on a few of the details as we walked from my hotel to the Amsterdam train station. Unlike the jolly, obese American Santa, St. Nicholas is painfully thin and dresses not unlike the Pope, topping his robes with a tall hat resembling an embroidered tea cozy. <laughs> the outfit, I was told, is a carryover from his former career when he served as the Bishop of Turkey. <laughs> I'm sorry, I said, but... <laughs> Could you repeat that? 
One doesn't want to be too much of a cultural chauvinist, but this seemed completely wrong to me. <laughs> For starters, Santa didn't used to do anything. <laughs> He's not retired, and more important, he has nothing to do with Turkey. It's too dangerous there, and the people wouldn't appreciate him. <laughs> When asked how he got from Turkey to the North Pole, Oscar told me with complete conviction that St. Nicholas currently resides in Spain, <laughs> which, again, is simply not true. <laughs> Though he could probably live wherever he wanted, Santa chose the North Pole specifically because it is harsh and isolated. No one can spy on him, and he doesn't have to worry about people coming to the door. Anyone can come to the door in Spain. And in that outfit, he'd most certainly be recognized. <laughs> On top of that, aside from a few pleasantries, Santa doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Can I get you some candy? Fine. He knows enough to get by. But he's not fluent, and he certainly doesn't eat tapas. <laughs> While our Santa flies in on a sled... The Dutch version arrives by boat and then transfers to a white horse. The event is televised and great crowds gather at the waterfront to greet him. I'm not sure if there's a set date, but he generally docks in late November and spends a few weeks hanging out and asking people what they want. Is it just him alone, I asked, or does he come with some backup? Oscar's English was close to perfect, but he seemed thrown by a term normally reserved for police reinforcement. <laughs> Helpers, I said. Does he have any elves? Maybe I'm overly sensitive, but I couldn't help but feel personally insulted when Oscar denounced the very idea as grotesque and unrealistic. <laughs> elves, he said. They are just so silly. <laughs> the word silly and unrealistic were redefined when I learned that St. Nicholas travels with what was consistently described as six to eight black men. <laughs> I asked several Dutch people to narrow it down, but none of them could give me an exact number. It was always six to eight, which seems strange seeing they've had hundreds of years to get an accurate head count. <laughs> The six to eight black men were characterized as personal slaves until the mid-1950s when the political climate changed and it was decided that instead of being slaves, they were just good friends. <laughs> I think history has proved that something usually comes between slavery and friendship. <laughs> A period of time marked not by cookies and quiet hours beside the fire, but by bloodshed and mutual hostility. <laughs> They have such violence in the Netherlands, but rather than duking it out amongst themselves, Santa and his former slaves decided to take it out on the public. <laughs> in the early years, if a child was naughty, St. Nicholas and the six to eight black men would beat him with what Oscar described as the small branch of a tree. <laughs> a switch? Yes, he said, that's it. They'd kick him and beat him with the switch. <laughs> Then, if the youngster was really bad, they'd put him in a sack and take him back to Spain. <laughs> St. Nicholas would kick you? <laughs> well, not anymore, Oscar said. Now he just pretends to kick you. <laughs> he considered this to be progressive, but in a way, I think it's almost more perverse than the original punishment. I'm going to hurt you, but not really. <laughs> How many times have we fallen for that line? The fake slap invariably makes contact, adding the elements of shock and betrayal to what had previously been plain old-fashioned fear. What kind of a Santa spends his time pretending to kick people before stuffing them into a canvas sack? <laughs> Then, of course, you've got the six to eight former slaves who could potentially go off at any moment. <laughs> This, I think, is the greatest difference between us and the Dutch. <laughs> While a certain segment of our population might be perfectly happy with the arrangement, 
If you told the average white American that six to eight nameless black men would be sneaking into his house in the middle of the night, <laughs> he would barricade the doors and arm himself with whatever he could get his hands on. Six to eight, did you say? <laughs> in the years before central heating, Dutch children would leave their shoes by the fireplace. The promise being that unless they plan to beat you, kick you, or stuff you into a sack, St. Nicholas and the six to eight black men would fill your clogs with presents. Aside from the threats of violence and kidnapping, it's not much different than hanging your stockings from the mantle. Now that so few people actually have a working fireplace, Dutch children are instructed to leave their shoes beside the radiator, furnace, or space heater. St. Nicholas and the six to eight black men arrive on horses which jump from the yard onto the roof. At this point, I guess they either jump back down and use the door <laughs> or stay put and vaporize through the pipes and electrical cords. Oscar wasn't too clear about the particulars, but really, who can blame him? We have the same problem with our Santa. He's supposed to use a chimney, but if you don't have one, he still manages to get in. It's best not to think about it too hard. <laughs> While eight flying reindeer are a hard pill to swallow, our Christmas story remains relatively dull. Santa lives with his wife in a remote polar village and spends one night a year traveling around the world. If you're bad, he leaves you coal. If you're good and live in America, he'll give you just about anything you want. <laughs> we tell our children to be good and send them off to bed where they lie awake, anticipating their great bounty. A Dutch parent has a decidedly hairier story to relate, <laughs> telling his children, listen, you might want to pack a few of your things together. <laughs> Before going to bed, the former bishop of Turkey will be coming to you, <laughs> along with six to eight black men. They might put some candy in your shoes. They might stuff you into a sack and take you to Spain. Or they might just pretend to kick you. We don't know for sure, but we want you to be prepared. This is a reward for living in the Netherlands. As a child, you get to hear this story. And as an adult, you get to turn around and repeat it. As an added bonus, the government has thrown in legalized drugs and prostitution. <laughs> so what's not to love about being Dutch? Oscar finished his story just as we arrived at the station. He was an amiable guy, very good company. But when he offered to wait until my train arrived, I begged off, claiming I had some calls to make. Sitting alone in the vast, vibrant terminal, surrounded by thousands of polite, seemingly interesting Dutch people. I couldn't help but feel second-rate. Yes, the Netherlands was a small country, but it had six to eight black men <laughs> and a really good bedtime story. <laughs> Being a fairly competitive person, I felt jealous, then bitter. I was edging toward hostile when I remembered the blind hunter tramping off alone into the Michigan forest. <laughs> he may bag a deer, or he may happily shoot a camper in the stomach. <laughs> he may find his way back to the car, or he may wander around for a week or two <laughs> before stumbling through your back door. <laughs> we don't know for sure, but in pinning that license to his chest, he inspires a sort of narrative that ultimately makes me proud to be an American. <laughs> I've been keeping a diary for 32 years. <laughs> and most of it's just whining, but every now and then I'll grow through it and pull a few things. February 2nd, 2008, Munich. When summoning books for married couples in America, I'll often ask if the two of them have any children. Then I'll wince as they answer, oh, our dogs are our children. 
as if teaching a pair of Springer Spaniels to stay off the sofa was really the same as keeping a 16-year-old out of prison. (laughs) In Germany, though, it's a different story. At last night's signing, I asked a woman if she had a dog. Then I watched as she picked her book off the table, saying, Oh, my children are my dogs. (laughs) August 27th. 2007, London. In order to get indefinite leave to remain, Hugh and I have to take a citizenship test. The preparation book is called Life in the UK, and it explains, among other things, the difference between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. I've learned that British women won the right to divorce their husbands in 1857, that children aged 14 or under are not allowed to deliver milk, and that they're... (laughs) And that there are 1.7 million people living in Northern Ireland. After studying for two weeks, I bought a book of multiple choice sample questions, two of which caused me to laugh. (laughs) Question. How might you stop young people from playing tricks on you at Halloween? (laughs) A. Call the police. B. Give them some money. C. Give them sweets or chocolates. D, hide from them. (laughs) Question, why did large numbers of Jewish people come to Britain during 1880 to 1910? A, to escape famine. B, to escape racist attacks. C, to work in textile factories. (laughs) D, to invade and seize land. November 15th, 2007, London. Harrods has opened a Krispy Kreme counter. And before sitting down to a donut and a cup of coffee, I went to the basement to use the restroom. There was a young man beside me at the urinal, and after he had finished and walked to the sink to wash his hands, the attendant asked him if he'd flushed. Uh, yeah, the young man said. No, you didn't. The attendant told him. The young man returned, and as he pulled the handle, we exchanged that particular glance, meaning the washroom attendant is crazy. (laughs) This was the sort of behavior you'd expect at a public toilet in Paris, but not in an apartment store, especially such a fancy one. The attendant was black and looked to be in his 60s. His accent suggested that he was from the West Indies, And his expression said in no uncertain terms that he hated these toilets and everyone who used them. When it came my turn, I made a great show of the flushing, (laughs) glaring at the urinal and its contents as if to say, be gone, you. (laughs) Then I washed my hands. There were towels folded beside the sink, but using one might have angered the attendant. And so instead, I wiped my hands on my pants. This seemed to please him. And I left the restroom thinking, he likes me. (laughs) January 9th, 2007, Tokyo. Given the state of my Japanese, it seems unfair to criticize some of the English I've been seeing. A sign outside a beauty parlor reads, I rash tint. (laughs) And instead of laughing, I should give them credit for at least coming close. What gets me are the mass-produced mistakes. The ones made at Lawson, for example. A huge nationwide chain of convenience stores. And this is what's printed on the wrappers of the ready-made sandwiches. We have sandwiches which you can enjoy different taste. So you can find your favorite one from our sandwiches. We hope you can choose the best one for yourselves. (laughs) You'd think that someone, maybe someone in management might say... I've got a cousin who lives in America. (laughs) What do you say I give him a call and we run this by him before we slap it on tens of millions of sandwiches? (laughs) But no. March 4th, 2009, London. There's a castle in Cheshire that's a popular site for weddings. 
And now for an extra fee, your rings can be delivered by a white barn owl that's been trained to fly across the room and land on a heavy leather glove worn by the groom. In return, it gets to eat a live rat, a live mouse, or a live day old chick. There was an article about him in yesterday's paper, and now, for the first time in my life, and for all the right reasons, I want to get married. Thank you. This is a fictional story written in the form of an email entitled, Just a Quick Email. Hey, Robin, just a quick email to thank you for the wedding gift or wedding gift certificate, I guess I should say. Two free pizzas. <laughs> how thoughtful of you and how generous. Any toppings we want. Maybe you hadn't heard that I'd registered at Tunbridge and Colchester, but I did. Last June, I think it was, just before we announced the engagement. Not that the pizzas didn't come in handy. They did, though in a slightly indirect way. Unlike you, who's so wonderfully unconcerned with what other people think, I'm a bit vain, especially when it comes to my figure. That being the case, I use the certificates to feed our workmen, who are currently building a slight addition. I know you thought our house was big enough already. Tara meets B&Q was how I heard you so cleverly describe it at the wedding. <laughs> I mean, really, you said, how much room do two people need? Or did you say two thin people? What with the band playing and everyone in the world shouting their congratulations, it was a little hard to hear, just like it is at our ever-expanding house the workers all hammering away. What they've done is tear down the wall between the kitchen and the breakfast nook. That'll give us room for a walk-in silverware drawer. <laughs> and this new 16-burner stove I've been eyeing. Plus, it will allow us to expand the counter space, put in a second dishwasher, and install an electric millstone for grinding blue corn. <laughs> Homemade tortillas, anyone? Then we're going to enclose that useless deck, insulate it, and create a separate dining room for when we go Asian. This will eliminate that ramp you're so fond of, but it's not like we see you all that often, and I don't think it will kill you to crawl up a half a dozen stairs. <laughs> as a matter of fact, as long as they're clean, I actually think it might be good for you. Seeing as we're on this subject, Robin, is it right to insist on all this special treatment? More than that, is it healthy? It's been almost a year since the car accident. Don't you think it's time you moved on with your life? Do I need to remind you of all my injuries? The dislocated shoulder, the practically broken wrist that still tingles when I do something strenuous like whisk in damp weather. <laughs> on top of that, it took me days to wash your blood out of my hair. The admitting nurse put me down as a redhead. That's how bad it was. Your left front tooth practically embedded in my skull. It's no severed spinal cord, of course, but like Dr. Scoggin says, the ball is in your court now. You can either live in the past as a lonely, bitter paraplegic, or you can live in the present as one. I dusted myself off and got back on the proverbial horse. So why can't you? In other news, did you get the postcard I sent from our honeymoon? Iraq was beautiful, just as I imagined it would be, but there were so many Americans there. <laughs> I said to Philip, is nowhere safe. I mean, really, in terms of the crowds, we might as well have gone to Paris. <laughs> then, of course, we did go to Paris, but... That was for work rather than vacation. Philip had a client he needed to meet, an American in town for some big Chablis auction. He once defended her on a drunk driving charge, and successfully, too. This despite her breathalyzer results and some pretty bad behavior, some of which was caught on video. 
Now they're suing the people she hit, or at least the one that lived. And it looks like they've got a fairly good chance of winning. This is not to worry you in any way. What with the addition on the house and the million and a half other things on my to-do list, a lawsuit is the last thing on my mind. Not that it wasn't proposed. <laughs> While my hard-working husband consulted with his client, I alone wandered the Ks, stopping every now and then to duck into a boutique. And more than once, I thought of you. For Paris, I remembered, is where you and Philip honeymooned. That was in the good old days when the dollar and the euro were practically even. Now it costs a king's ransom just for a cup of coffee and a croc madame, so a pair of shoes from Christian Lobotin, well, you can just imagine. I suppose it for you it would make sense, but for someone who walks the way I do, someone known to practically gallop when there's a sale taking place, the <laughs> shoes I got are good for one, maybe two seasons at most. Still, though, what could I do? A rock had been totally picked over by the time we arrived, and <laughs> I wanted a little something to remind me of my trip. After returning stateside, Philip went right to work, his number one job to make me happy. First, we started on the addition, and then a successful effort to erase that DWI from my driving record. It wasn't easy, but legal matters rarely are. All I can say is that if it helps to have friends, it helps even more to have friends who are governors. <laughs> None of this will get you out of your wheelchair, but it will restore my self-confidence. <laughs> and what I like to think of as my good name. It means as well that you'll have to stop calling me the drunken bitch who took away your legs and then stole your husband. Drunk, it seems, is a relative term. And if I were you, I'd watch how I used it. The leg bit is an exaggeration, as you clearly still have them. Big purple veins and all. As for the stealing, Philip came to me on his own volition. One adult to another, no coercion involved. In the end, all you're left with is a single word, bitch, which could mean any number of things. I myself would use it to describe someone whose idea of an appropriate wedding present is a gift certificate for two pizzas. <laughs> Offering it to your ex-husband, I can understand. But to your own sister. <laughs> That's just tacky. <laughs> Gotta run, Rhonda. Rhonda.